but I just really quick, uh, we were praying about the direction of this morning, and um, we're actually going to have my husband David share. Um, the thing that I love about my husband is he, you know, apart from Jesus, he is my rock, and I can't really do what I do without him, and I'm just so thankful for him, and there is so much wisdom on the inside of him, and I just felt like you guys need to experience that today, and he's just such an encouragement, but um, uh, you know, the church that we're a part of, my dad is the senior leader there, and I say, you know, it's really hard. It's a whole long story, but we're going to actually be transitioning in a couple of years to, to, to pastor my dad's church when he retires, which we're really excited about. Um, amen. But what I tell people is, obviously, my dad is my pastor, but my husband is my pastor. And I'm just so thankful for a covering that supports and protects and encourages and just tells me to dream. And then he'll try to work out the logistics along the way. <laughs> so anyways, babes, you take it. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Awesome. So I told Catherine, I feel like I have a word for this house. Now, who's, who actually is from this church? I would say this is your church. Okay. Is there anybody that you're just coming as visitors? Okay, well, I felt a word for this church, but it's not for this ch just this church, but it's this region, okay? This morning, I woke up early. I didn't want to wake up that early. Has anyone ever had that happen? Like, you want to sleep in, but you wake up. I woke up early, and I said, okay, Lord, I'm up. What do you have for coming to church today? Because I have something to share with you that was already pre-planned, okay? But I was like, Lord, why? What is it? So the Lord's so faithful. When you ask and then you listen, he's always faithful to speak. Amen? So this is what I saw. I saw a big wind, like the breath of God, coming over this area. This church, but it's not just with this church, it's this region. It's the breath of God. And it's life. And it's power. Okay? It's power for every one of you individually, but it's also power for you corporately because we're a corporate body. And this is not just to make us feel good. This is not just for us to have chills on Sunday morning and life is great. This breath of God is coming with an agenda. And this is what I heard, to restore and to take back what the enemy has stolen. Okay? So then, with that, I felt this verse, and this is a story that I've not been, hu i known about it, but it's not like one I'm super familiar with, but it's a story in 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I'm not going to go through the, every detail of the story, but basically what happens is, is David and his army, they're out doing some stuff, and some, en some enemy, the enemy comes in to their hometown where their women and children are at, they take over the hometown, they capture their women and children, take all their stuff and burn down the city. David and his men come back, all right? And they're devastated. It says these men, okay, men, tough warriors, wept. Devastated. And these guys are so upset, they're actually plotting to kill David, their leader, okay? So David goes, the prophet of God, takes the ephod, not really sure what ephod is, but it's, it's important. <laughs> Make sure you have an ephod. <laughs> and he goes, Lord, what should I do? If we go and try to get our stuff back, will we succeed? He asks the Lord, will we succeed? The Lord says, yes. So he takes them and he says, we're going to go get our stuff back. All right? 600 men go with him. They come to this brook. They come to this place where there is an obstacle to, to cross. 200 men are exhausted, and they say, we can't keep going. So they stop, and they stay behind. 400 men continue, and most of you know this story. They capture what the enemy had stolen and bring it back. They get to the point, all of a sudden, where they regroup with the men who had stayed behind. And the men don't want them to share in the reward. They're upset because they did not play the same role that the men who went and got the things played. Hear this. They're upset about it. David says this. This is amazing. The point of the story, what's so profound to me is what happens after this. He says, no, they should share in this too. And he says, we should respect the role of the people that go to battle, but also stay, stay behind and guard the equipment. Yeah. 
And he says this decree stood through Israel even until today. This profound thing. Okay? These men were upset and did not want to share with what they'd had because they all didn't play the same role. Get this. We're a body with many parts. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us this, right? That means we're all going to have different roles to play. The enemy, one of his tactics is to come into a body and bring division where the body parts don't respect or realize the need and the value of every other part, okay? So today, I want to talk about something that is vital, especially as God breathes with an agenda to, for his body to do something, to achieve a mission. You better believe when you start going into the enemy's territory, the enemy is going to start attacking you. The body, and if he can get his foot in the door, he'll take it. You give him an inch, he'll take a mile. When you start doing the real work of God, that's when you become on the enemy's radar. If you're a church that is stagnant, the enemy is very happy with you. He will not bother you. He's like, hey, keep doing your thing. Okay? But when you start poking him, so that's why what I'm going to talk about, this thing of honor is so vital because if it's not established, the body will not function properly. We're one body, many parts. Honor is the glue that holds the parts together. I would argue that in the American church, by and large, we have churches that are parts, but they're not a body. Because they've lost the art of honor. Honor is this really big topic in the Bible. We see it everywhere, okay? And it pretty much, it pretty much plays a part in every aspect of our life, from our relationship with God, to what we do with our life, but also to how we view others and how we treat others, okay? So it's this really big topic, and honor is something that is both on the inside of us and demonstrated outwardly. And in an Isaiah, I think it's 29, God tells us this. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. What he's letting us know is, is that you can demonstrate honor. You can demonstrate everything right on the outside, but if the inside is not right, that cancels out all the stuff done on the outside. So honor is one of these things that we have to get it right on the inside of us in order to demonstrate it, in order for it to count. I played sports growing up. I'm kind of like, Lord, how do I get the points to count? <laughs> and so this is something that's on the inside and is demonstrated outwardly, okay? So Paul tells us this. It's very interesting. In Romans 12.10, he says... He tells us to love, our bro- love each other with brotherly affection. And then the very next sentence, he says, outdo one another in showing honor. Now, I've always said this for years. I've said we shouldn't have competition in the church. Has anyone ever said that? Hey, guys, listen, we're all, you know, we're on the same team here. We don't need to have competition. Well, Paul says we do. And we're competing with one another to see who can show the most honor to others. Okay, and so I know honor is like this big topic, okay? So I want to narrow down, just for simplicity's sake, I want to narrow down the definition of how do we define honor. Honor is placing value on something. When you value something, you will treat it differently than something that you don't value. Amen? If you give me like a Georgia Bulldogs hat, I'm going to wear it. I'm going to take care of it. If you give me a North Carolina Tar Heels hat... I'm not really going to take care of that because I don't value it. (laughs) Just trying to be honest, y'all. I'm a messenger from a far off land. (laughs) When we value something, we'll treat it differently. Honor is something that is on the inside of us. When we look at others, when we look at the body, when we look at all the differences, we will see the value in it. Honor is also one of these things where it's a cost and reward type of thing in our life. And we see this all over the Bible. There's so many things. Just the Christian life itself, there's so much reward, but there's a cost. We all love that verse. I think it's Luke 6, 38. It says, give and you will receive. Press down, shaken together, running over. We love that verse. We all quote it. 
But nevertheless, that verse has a cost. It starts with a cost that has to be paid. If you don't give, you don't receive. Honors like that. And one of the mistakes that we can make as Christians is that we focus only on the cost of something. What do I have to give up? What do I have to change? And if we only focus on the cost, if we don't recognize there's a reward, then we won't want to pay the cost. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have to give this up? Oh, I can't do this Christian thing. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to go through this? I can't do that. I'm going to have to give my Sunday mornings hunting trips up to go to church? Oh, it's cost too much. It's a cost and reward. So I want to present to you some costs of showing honor, but then I want to present to you some rewards of showing honor. And I would argue that the rewards far outweigh the cost. Yes. Yes. Think about this. Let me give you an example. If I came up to you and I said, give me $1,000, you'd probably be like, what? No. First thing, ask nicely. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, if I don't give you any reason why, if there's no aspect of a reward, you're going to be less inclined to give me $1,000. But if I came up to you and I said, give me $1,000, and if you do, I'll give you this $10,000 in return, do you think you would be offended then? Do you think that you would have a problem with paying that cost? You'd be like, no, hey, that's a fair trade. <laughs> I like this. This is what honor's like. And this is the invitation the Lord's trying to give us through his word. He's like, this is not going to be easy. It's going to cost you, but the reward is great. So the first thing that showing honor to others, not just in how we treat them. Listen, I can, I've listened for years. We can all play that church thing. You know, smile. Hey, brother, I love you. You're great. And then when they're gone, we're not necessarily honoring them like that. Okay? The Lord is keeping track of those things when everyone's not watching. The Lord's keeping track of our thoughts, what's in our heart. When we come before him one day, there's a, there's a thing in scripture that says that everything that is hidden in the dark will be brought to the light eventually. So we have, to, we have to be on top of these things on the inside of us. So the first thing that showing honor is going to cost you is your selfishness. Philippians 2, 3, it's just one verse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the first half. Let me read it. I don't want to misquote it says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. If you want to show honor, you're going to have to give up your selfish motives. I have, for years, have served in church, pretty much from when I came to the age where I had something to offer the church I was serving. And a lot of people would look at my life, and they would look at my example and say, this guy's really just honoring. He's really humble. He's got a servant's heart, okay? That was what's demonstrated outwardly. On the inside, what was really there is I wanted to impress others. And I really wanted to gain honor. You know how we can do humble things, but we want people to realize how humble we are? That's not humility. <laughs> That's what I, would, what's what I did for years. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect in that, you know, but I recognize this. The Lord pointed this out in my life. You're doing these wonderful things. Your motives seem good, but they're not. They're selfish. Because I was only concerned about whether or not I was being honored. That was my main concern. In order to show honor for, with, for others, you're going to have to get your focus off yourself. You're going to have to get your focus off of whether or not you're being honored or not. And just give honor to others. Many times we say, okay, if once I feel honored, then I'll give honor. We don't say that, but that's really the case. We come to church, no one's honoring me, so I'm not going to show honor to anybody. That's not what the Bible shows us. This is a give to get thing in Scripture. You know, anyone that's married, if you've ever had marriage counseling, Catherine and I haven't, we're great. <laughs> but the concept is, is sometimes in marriages, both husband and wife can disagree on something and they refuse to give in. And the idea is, is that if someone doesn't give in, you're not going to have reconciliation. Someone has to at least try. This is the same thing with showing honor. Is you'll go your whole life and maybe you never will feel honored, so you refuse to show honor. You re refuse to place the value on someone. Paul says show. It's a demonstration. It's an outward expression. It's not just a thought. It's saying, hey, I value you. I see the value in your life. I see the calling 
I see the giftings of God. And you'll have to let go of worrying about yourself. The next thing that honor will cost you is pride. The next part, the next half of this verse, Philippians 2, 3. It says, be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Years ago, I finally managed to master humility. I'm writing a book on it. (laughs) I'm kidding. Be humble. Think of others better than yourself. This idea of thinking of others better than yourself, this is not like a practicality thing of where you just where you just like are blind to reality like hey you know you could be like a professional in your career field and you know this is not saying hey people are just better than me at everything okay honor is not blind we're not talking about practicalities we're talking about the heart of something okay there's skills and abilities that you have that I don't have and you're better than me at those okay and vice versa This is where we recognize that every single human being has value because every single human being is a creation of God made in his image. Even Peter tells us, honor everybody. This doesn't even mean whether they're Christian or not, whether they're good or bad. The first thing we recognize is is they are a creation of God made in his image. And then Peter also lets us know that God wants none of them to perish. He loves them all. Doesn't want any of them to go to hell. So that is the ground level perspective for every human being that we look at is that God values them. You think someone's too bad for God's salvation? Look at yourself. All of us are sinners. None of us deserve it. It is going to cost you your pride because you're going to to be called to show honor to people that don't agree with you. And it's very hard sometimes when people don't agree with you to show honor. It's very easy when you're tracking and you agree on everything, they're your buds. Yeah, I can show them honor easily. What about that part of the body that sees life from a different perspective than you do? When you're called to something, when you get on fire for God, your passion for your calling begins to rise up. That means your viewpoint for what matters the most rises up. And different parts of the body are going to have different viewpoints. The eye sees life differently than the feet do. They have different purposes, different tasks. An evangelist is going to have a different emphasis on what needs to be done versus a pastor, versus a prophet, versus a a teacher. The trick is, is that we're not going to agree. We're not going to have the same priority, but how do we work together? It's honor. We recognize the value and the need. The giftings of the Holy Spirit. Paul shows us that God determines who gets what gift. You can't go to God and say, hey, I want to, I want to be a prophet. It doesn't work like that. The Holy Spirit decides what you get. But nevertheless, Paul says this about every single different gifting, is that they're meant for others. Your gifting is not meant for your promotion. It's meant to benefit others. So when we recognize that, that our gifting is meant for others, then we also recognize that other people's giftings are meant for our benefit. But how do we tap into the benefit? We honor them. We recognize the value of that gifting. That'll cost you your pride, though. When people dishonor you, that is not a license to show dishonor to someone else. There's some hard verses in the Bible. I don't necessarily like them, but nevertheless, they're there. Bless those who persecute you. Jesus demonstrated this on the cross. He gave us a good standard to live by. Hanging there, betrayed, brutally beaten, mocked in every way possible. And he says, Father, forgive them. But they don't know what they're doing. The first martyr, Stephen, Trying to save these people. Stoned to death. Father, forgive them. People will persecute us, but our response is is we honor them. It'll cost you your pride. One of the ways that pride sneaks into our life and it hides, we don't realize it's there, is through false humility. Have you heard of this term? I'm sure you have. False humility. We know that we know the, the standard definition to 
pride. It's, it's kind of like someone who's arrogant, overly confident. They have like an overly high sense of self, right? That's the typical definition of pride. There's another definition. There's another form of pride, and it comes out in false humility. False humility is when you have too low of a self-esteem. You have too low of opinion of yourself. And what happens is, is you make your opinion of yourself more important than God's. That is also prideful. It's the ones going around, I'm just worthless. I'm just no good. Oh, don't, don't say anything nice to me. I'm just a no good person. Hey, don't look at me. I'm just worthless. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece, made new in Christ Jesus, his creation. When we're Christians, we lose the license to bash ourselves because we're his creation. My little nephew came up to me one time. He's like seven years old. He had colored a picture. He brought it up to me, and I, and I looked at it, and I was like, this is amazing. This is awesome. I just gave praise to his to his. To his drawing who do you think in that moment received the glory who do you think in that moment was proud it was my nephew because i liked his creation there's this idea it's like a religious thing like hey we don't want to steal glory from god why would god tell us to honor others why is that a universal law for the body of christ because we have a need to be honored Honor is not just fluffy words. It's powerful, and it's something that propels us in what we're called to do. The other thing that showing honor will cost you is your understanding. And this is probably the one that's challenged me the most in life because I'm very analytical. I'm an engineer by trade, so I I study, I research, I, I, I seek to understand. There's many things in the Bible that we're called to do that doesn't make sense. And the problem is is that Christians are trying to make stuff make sense before obeying. That's not what the Bible calls us to do. It calls us to live by faith. Faith is believing without seeing. Seeing is not just eyesight, but it's mental sight. It's understanding. I see and understand. Now I obey. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible's not looking for us to make sense, to answer the question why we show honor. The Bible just says do it. There's a Proverbs, what, 3, 5, says, uh, trust in God with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. This is one of those things it's talking about here because sometimes people who are honored will not make sense to us, okay? And this is where I want us to hear right now, and this is a big deal, especially in the ministry world. As God is breathing life on this area God is impacting the area. God is bringing in more people. God is saving souls. He's changing lives. Within that, every single person has a calling. Okay? When you get awakened to that calling, there's an expectation of, I need to be used in this. And then God gave us the gifts of church leadership to do their best to make you all successful in what you're called to do. They're not running the show on their own terms. They're accountable to God. And just because you have that calling activated in your heart, just because you feel those things stirring, that desire, that does not mean that you're going to be promoted immediately. Because promotion comes from the Lord. I went for years feeling dishonored. Years. I felt like I worked the hardest. Felt like I was the best. Felt like I was not recognized in leadership. And I felt dishonored. When you live from a place of constantly feeling dishonored, that's what's going to grow in your heart, and that's what you'll demonstrate outwardly. One day I was talking to the Lord, and I said, Lord, what is this? Are they blind? And the Lord said, you're not promoted because I don't want you to be promoted yet. And I was like, have have you really thought about this? I mean, do you not see what's going on? (laughs) Just kidding. But the Lord really did tell me that. It convicted me, but it changed my perspective. 
Church leadership is not set up to keep you held back. But there is a timing process because the Lord promotes. King David was anointed as a king. The value of a king was in King David, but he did not become king until years later. And the Lord is so faithful to train us and put us through a process to get us ready to sustain what he has for us. Be faithful in the small, and I will make you responsible over the many, the great. That's his terms. But yet, we, when we get into the church, we begin this struggle and this tension of, hey, just recognize me. And what we do is we don't actually trust that God is capable of promoting us at the right time in the right way. So we cause tension with church leaders, the ones who are making the decisions, the ones who have the authority. God is very capable of fighting your battles. The question is, do you trust him? Do you think he's all-powerful? If he wanted you in an instant, in any position, any level of authority, he could do it. I caused so much tension for years. I lived in so much offense for years because I wasn't getting what I felt like I deserved. Instead, I should have been showing honor to the ones that God had put in above me, the gifts that God had put in above me. That does not mean that they're always right or they do everything perfect. So honor will cost, okay? There is a cost. Our selfishness, our pride, our understanding, but there is a massive reward with honor. The Bible shows us in many places, and actually I have, I have one verse, just an example. Let me get a drink of water real quick. Sorry, one sec. The Bible shows us in many places that when you're faithful to give honor, okay, that God is going to honor you in return. Check this out. This is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. This verse is very revealing. Uh, Peter who wrote this was one of the disciples who wanted to be honored when he was a disciple. He wanted to be like, Lord, I'm your best. He learned some lessons over time. We learn that honor comes from the Lord. Our being honored, that comes from God. The only thing we have to worry about is, are we doing this right? And he's faithful. He's faithful to honor his word. When it comes to the matter of timing, we trust him. When it doesn't make sense, we trust him. The enemy wants you offended. Because if he can get you offended, he can get you out of here. And you have a place and a purpose here. If you're not from this church, you have a place and a purpose at your church. The enemy can get you here. Then he's won. The battle is over belief, right? All he has to do is to get you to believe something that is not the truth. Anything. And I get it. You look on social media. You talk to your friends. And just because your friend loves you does not mean they're giving you wise counsel. The word of God is the wise counsel. Are they counseling you from the word of God? Or are they giving you emotional responses? Some of you, I feel like right now, you talk to your mother a lot, but she's not a Christian. And she gives you all this counsel. And it's bad counsel. You can love your mother, you can pray for her, but you don't have to do everything that she says. I feel like that's for somebody here. The next thing that showing honor will reward you with is peace. This is 1 Peter 5, this is the very next verse. Verse 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. For years I lived my life fending for myself because really at the heart of it is I didn't think God cared about me. I didn't believe his word. I felt like I was alone. I had to fight my own battles. God's not going to take care of me, so I'm just going to have to fend for myself. And, and you, you can recognize his people. You're always defending yourself, always defending yourself, always pushing yourself. The moment someone tries to criticize you, maybe, they're, maybe someone's trying to build you up and you don't recognize this, and you just get offended, offended, overly sensitive. 
I do not like getting constructive feedback at all. I think I'm right about everything. I'm very headstrong. I'm very confident in my ways of doing things. The first time that I kind of received constructive criticism, I just got so mad. And I literally thought that, that the person who had said this to me was completely wrong and their heart motives were wrong, okay? This person actually loved me and they were, they, they were better. It was a pastor. I was not a pastor. I was under him. And I got so offended at him and he was really trying to help me. Looking back, he was, he was right what he said to me. Getting constructive criticism has helped me the most in my life to grow and develop. Learning, learning to receive that, even though sometimes it hurts. Learning to receive that. In the church world, in the ministry world, we have a calling and a mission. But just because you have that doesn't mean you have free license to do whatever you want to do. Leaders are put in the body of Christ to train, equip, equip and raise up. All of us need training. All, the gifts of God are free. Maturity in the gifts, take time. Take growing in them, maturing. Let's take prophecy, for example. Corinthians 12. All of us should pursue the prophetic. Not because it's the best, but it's the most beneficial when we come together corporately. But every time someone gives a prophetic word, it's meant to be judged. We leave that part out. We think just if we could say, God told me that it's automatically right. No. I'm glad that God changed the rules from the Old Testament because if you were wrong in the Old Testament, you just died. <laughs> Things are a little bit, you know, there's some uh, growing room now. <laughs> but you're still covered. You're still accountable. And the problem ha we have is in the social media world, we have these self-proclaimed prophets bantering anything they want with no accountability, no covering. Because we've lost this art of honor. When you honor the value of a leader in your life, you'll honor the hard things they say to you too. There's a couple of verses in Ephesians. Um, I want to read to you these real quick. Ephesians 4.8. Paul tells us, he gives us some insight how to show honor. There's two concepts because we're talking about internal and external, Right? So the first one he deals with is the internal. How do we fix this? When all this junk is inside of us, but we, don't, we know it's supposed to be fixed, what is the magic thing? He, he shows us. He says, this is Ephesians 4, cha uh, chapter 4, verse 8. This is the second part of that verse, second half. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What Paul tells us is, is fix your thoughts He's saying it is your job to take ownership of your thoughts and recognize that you have a choice to fix them. You have a choice on what you choose to dwell on. When you think about that person that aggravates you, you have a choice of what you're going to dwell on. Are you going to dwell on all the things you don't like? Or are you going to fix your thoughts and focus on what are the things of value in them? What has God placed on the inside of them? There are some people that aggravate me like you wouldn't believe. And there are some people that I aggravate that you wouldn't believe. Ask my wife. She loves me. But listen, that love is patient. <laughs> we play this victim card where we act like we don't have any control in the situation. I just can't help it in my thoughts. Above. No, that's not true. The Bible would say you're wrong. You have the power, and you're commanded to fix your thoughts. I can conjure up anger in my heart all day. When I think about someone I don't like, I just build it up, and I just keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it, and daydreaming about just punching them in the face. Let's be honest. Have we probably done that? <laughs> fix your thoughts. That's step one. Get the internal right. Fix your thoughts. Sometimes when I can't see the value in someone, I'll ask the Lord, let me see them through your eyes. And he's always been faithful to do this. Let me see the things of value that you've placed on them through your eyes. Help me. And he does. The second thing, the outward expression of honor. Same chapter, just a few verses down, Ephesians 4.29. 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Not building them up according to what you think they need, but according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. It's not enough just to think good thoughts about people. As Christians, we can be very uh, safe in our silence. Speaking good things to people, showing honor, takes effort. This is a call for all Christians. You're like, well, that's not my personality. Well, then go to God and get breakthrough until it becomes your personality. We are called to speak life to our brothers and sisters. We're called to encourage. We fix our thoughts. We focus on the things of value in them, and then we tell them. We let them know, hey, I honor you. I see this value in you. When you don't do that, that's just lazy Christianity. My parents raising me, they said this, and maybe you've said this before, but they would tell me, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. You ever heard that? That's a good, that's a good statement. I like it. But it's only half truth. According to the Bible, what it should say is if you don't have anything nice to say, then search until you do and then say it. Amen? The other reward for honor is a uh, fruit. John 15, God, Jesus tells us some very serious things. He said, your mission in life, if you choose to accept it, is to bear fruit. That does not mean if you grow apples and bananas, you win. I asked the Lord that one time. Do I get points if I just grow some fruit? No, this is a spiritual thing. You bear fruit. There's many ways that we could bear fruit, okay? The first thing that we need to recognize is that fruit is being barren, born. Fruit is growing <laughs> in our own life. When we show honor, when selfishness dies, when pride dies, when we lay down our own understanding, that is fruit that is growing in our individual life. Boom, check. When we show honor to others, that is going to help fruit grow in their life. They're going to be encouraged to step into their calling, validated. You're bearing fruit in their life. Then there's a third one. This is the big one. Helps us grow new fruit. Because the fact that God calls us to honor everybody, it gives us an indicator that everyone was created with a need for honor. The world out there is highly critical. The world will tear you down faster than anything. Every single person is seeking that validation, that thing of value. They want it. The church was meant to be a place where they could find it. It It's meant to be a beautiful place, a fertile soil, where if you need to succeed in life and who you're called to be, come to the church and you will succeed. When the church grasps this thing of honor, it'll pull the world in. It'll be beautiful. They'll want it. The church has not been that. Because the church has not really been doing the work of Christ. They come into a building and they just fight. Fight over power. Fight over being recognized. This leads to my last point of what honor will bring us, and that's revival. Mark chapter 6, maybe. I'll look on my notes, okay. Yes, Mark 6. Come on, guys, show honor. <laughs> Thank you. Mark 6. And she's on, my wife is so on her. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Jesus comes to his hometown. At this point in the story of Jesus' life, he's already started doing amazing things. He comes back to his hometown. Jesus wants to bring revival to his hometown. I mean, he loves everybody. He's God. God loves everybody. But these are people that he grew up with. Even his half-brothers are there. 
his mother. He wants them to experience the kingdom of heaven like other places already are. He comes, we know the story. When Jesus comes, they judge him off his humanity. Isn't this Jesus? Isn't this what he does for a living? Isn't this his relatives? It says something very profound. It says that Jesus did not do miracles, just a few. I think he healed a couple sick people. Jesus did not bring revival to the magnitude that he wanted to because he was not honored. Jesus is not here with us today in the flesh, right? This was 2,000 years ago. But he is here today in the spirit, placed in every single one of us. And just like that hometown back then, we are all standing in the same position with the same test. Will we look and judge the humanity of our brothers and sisters around us? Or will we recognize, I see the spirit of Christ in you. I see the value of God. I see the calling of God on your life. I see the gifting and the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you recognize that? Or will you say, oh, that's just Bill. He used to be a drunk downtown. He ain't going to do anything good. You want revival? Start looking at the springs that God's placed around you. It's not some magic thing that falls from heaven. It's not enough to fill a church building. Lots of places are doing that. When you start doing the work of Christ, this stuff is going to matter. So, Father, I just declare in Jesus' name. That every single one of you, you've given your life to Christ, you're recruited and have a call of God on your life. I don't care if no one has ever shown you value. I don't care if your parents never said they loved you. God loves you. And he's a perfect father. You're not an orphan. You're not abandoned. You're not a side thought. He has a specific calling and plan on your life. And it's his job to promote you, to establish you in that, to give you the power you need to do the calling and everything he has for you. I declare that over you. So I say, be released that burden that you were never meant to carry. Trying to fend and establish yourself. And I rebuke the divisive spirits that would come in and try to stop the move of God that is already happening. And I cancel every curse that's been spoken over church leaders in this body. Everything said in the dark, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. They're accountable to God, not you. God's the one that called them, not you. And they're humans just like all of us, and they will not always do things perfect. That's not the point. We have honor, we have grace and patience with one another. We honor what God has established. Listen, no one asked me to say this, by the way. This is not, you know, Pastor Mike did not say, hey, man, I need you to come, like, fix some stuff over here. I asked the Lord, hey, what's the word? I have no idea what's the inner workings going on, okay? I'm just going to trust that this is for somebody. Even if you're not here, maybe this is, you needed to hear this. Because you're in a church right now, maybe you're going through this very thing. Trust the Lord that he cares about you. And trust him that he's all powerful. I think there's a verse in Romans that says every single person in authority, not just church authority, y'all, world authority was placed there by God. If you want to know how powerful our God is, if you want to understand, is God really in control? Listen, I know things out there are messed up. Don't for a second believe that God's not in control. All powerful. He has a calling on your life and he's faithful. What is it? Hebrews 12. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's going to finish what he started in you. He did not put desires and calling in your heart just to abandon you and then not to be fulfilled. Trust him. Get in your word. Get in prayer. Don't spend your days bickering how no, people, no one honors you. Go to God and praise him and show honor. It's in the death of ourselves that we experience the resurrection power of Christ. Amen? So, Father, I just speak life in the name of Jesus. I speak success. I, be, I speak forward momentum in your walk, in your life. And um, woman with the yellow bandana...
The Lord says there is a miraculous anointing on you for the supernatural, for miracles. There's boldness. In Acts, they were scared. They asked the Holy Spirit for boldness. Because when it comes to the supernatural, we're always going to be afraid. And the enemies try to attack you with doubt when you want to contend for things and you feel like you're crazy. The Lord says, I've given you anointing to break down strongholds and know that I've called you and placed purpose on you for that. So step out and trust me. And you may look like a fool to the world, but you're a princess in my eyes. And I just want to agree with that word. What I, um, what I heard the Lord kind of saying is you've been uncomfortable in some situations, and it's because it's a Joseph anointing that he's given you a coat of many colors, and some people can't really handle that around you. Um, but I just, I just release over you that God sees you and that he's lifting you up and calling you for such a time as this. And I hear the Lord saying, get comfortable in the, in the, in the Joseph anointing because he's giving you authority in this season in Jesus' name. Purple, pink shirt, not sure, color stuff. The Lord says you're not an afterthought, you're not a side thought, that he's got his spotlight on you in this moment, and there's nothing but growth all around you that you don't see his inner workings and behind the scenes. He says, I'm doing it all. I'm handling it all. You just walk in it. There's a garden of life around you, and you're going to start seeing things sprout up. So start walking in joy and walking in victory. I don't care what's going on around you, the Lord says. Walk in victory because you're in it, and I am working things out. You just watch as I do this. Watch as I do this. So I declare the peace and the joy of, of God over her life in the name of Jesus. And I just see the Lord parting the Red Sea over some situations in your life that have been really difficult. And I heard the Lord say that he's the one that's, that's fixing the situations and he's parting the Red Sea so you can walk on dry land to the place that he has for you. And so we release grace for that in this season. Uh, right here. The Lord says you're a prayer warrior. And I've called you to intercede and keep doing it because you're causing change. And don't stop. But he says, actually do some more. He says, I'm upping, I'm upping the commitment level because what you're doing matters. So keep it up. And I see you commanding angels, not commanding, but sending angels to different things. He says, keep doing that. That's good. That's good. And I just see it, it's like um, when, a, when a rock is tossed into a lake, there's ripple effect. And I just see it's like you're praying for one situation, but it's impacting a larger region and a larger sphere than you realize. So keep on throwing those spiritual rocks because it's changing things. Um. Huh? <laughs> um, also, as, as this, ch this church is already in this, okay? This breath of God, this stuff you're seeing, there is a very spiritual thing that's going on. The baby's fine. Kids are, kids are a blessing. As God is doing this, it's very easy. This is the temptation to get caught up in the, what, the quote-unquote success. God is doing this to come and take back what the enemy's stolen over this region. Drugs are a big issue in this region. You're going to need the power of God, not just good words, not just fancy production. You're going to need the, the real power of God to bring deliverance, to bring breakthrough healing, and to draw them in. Jesus did not need elevation worship to pull a crowd. And you're going to start seeing this, but what you're going to do is you're going to start hitting the enemy where it hurts. You're going to, put, they're, you're going to be on their radar. And listen, they're not afraid of attacking. They don't play by the rules. This is a call. You're going to need to cover your leadership with prayer. This is not a joke. As you press into this, they're going to need to be covered because the enemy will come after them. Many times we see these horrible things happen to leaders because their body wasn't covering them. What do we see when Peter was in prison in Acts? The church prayed and they were miraculously freed. We need a praying church and a praying body that's not upset because they're not getting what they want covering their leadership because they've been called and listen the world is going to hate them because they're being in the, bringing the message of God and as you're raised up the world is going to hate you it makes church mean something more when you're out there getting persecuted for standing up for truth this means more than just a you know a fun country club pray for your leaders
I'm not mad, by the way. <laughs> it's like that prophetic word. <laughs> the Lord loves you. You're his gentle flower. <laughs> They're like, whoa. Blue shirt. Are y'all married? Okay. Prophetic. <laughs> Nailed it. You're very special to the Lord. You're very special, and there is a finesse to both your ministries because they're meant to be intertwined. There's a finesse, but it's not going to be easy. There's struggle to, to, to work that out. And the Lord says, but work it out. Humble yourself because there's a finesse. That's all I hear. It's a finesse. It's a strategy of God that it's going to bring breakthrough to areas that's hard to reach. Can we just release grace over you guys? And I just see the Lord strengthening that three chord, the Holy Spirit in you guys. And I just thank you, Lord, that you just have that perfect plan and that you're weaving that rope so intricately in this season. And it's just going to produce so much fruit in Jesus' name. And uh, I'm not sure if this is true, but I just felt like a delay in things happening, a delay in breakthrough, and um, some times of rejection, maybe from years ago where the enemies tried to halt what God was doing in your life. But the Lord says, don't worry about that. There were things on my timing that felt, it felt like delay. He said, that was intentional because I'm growing things inside of you. And uh, because you're going to carry, you're going to carry a good amount, um, not just spiritually, but practically. There's, I don't know, um, I don't know if you have like a business or something like that, but you're going to carry a lot in the practical as well. And there's going to be, there's maturity he's developed in you in order to sustain that. Yeah. All right, y'all. Uh, I love you. Thank you for hearing me out, hearing me ramble for what? Well, that was like 15 minutes, right? <laughs> I love you all. I think Pastor Mike's going to close up. We're excited for what God's going to do this weekend. Amen. Amen. We're excited. Pastor Mike, love you, man.